Okay, so the other, this is true. The other day in Los Angeles, I was talking to this guy, and he said, you know that old saying, fake it till you make it? I've been doing that so long that people think I'm empathetic. And I was a, it was a genuine revelation to me. I don't know if, if you've, you've had to have heard the saying, you know, fake it till you make it. And it's the hippy skippy way of saying to encourage you to like pretend that you're sane or you're happy, you're engaged in life, you're willing, able and ready to accept your life as it happens. And it's a lot like what my stepmother and my grandmother would tell me all the time in a less hippy skippy kind of way, which was just like, keep going, you know, keep moving, keep working. Uh, and this day or this task will eventually pass. You know, this will soon be over. And their why was less goal-oriented and more, well, you do it because you have to. You know, you don't, you don't stop. And then you will grow up and you learn that you, you can actually stop. You can just give up. You know, you can crawl into a bottle. You can check out drugs, booze, meds, food, exercise, sex, suicide, go out for cigarettes, never come back. You do whatever you want, right? And the best example of this was my biological mother. Uh, I've told the story before, but the deal is with my parents is that it was the 50s. You know, she was 16, he was 17, she got pregnant, he joined the Navy. It was very romantic. And, um, <laughs> but she was supposed to raise us kids. You know, because my dad's dad, my grandfather, had always given his check to my grandmother and left the raising to her. But they had one kid, and my grandmother was 42. My mother, my biological mother, was 17. So my father would come home and give her the check. And from that check, she was supposed to feed us and clothe us and pay the bills and save for a rainy day. But it turns out that if you're 17, your financial planning skills are not excellent. <laughs> so uh, she would essentially just like buy new furniture. We would, our, our clothes would get dirty. She would shove them in a closet uh, and, until we were wearing like weird outfits. Like I would be, uh, uh, there, every picture of me, I'm either wearing a brand new dress as a, as a tiny child or I'm wearing like a pillowcase <laughs> and a pair of red tights. <laughs> It's a good look, anyway, but um, yeah, my father was an only child and I'm the youngest of six. And my mother was one of a big family. Like my dad, she was also the first generation, uh, child of first generation immigrants from Ireland and Norway. And I barely knew her. My brothers insist that she tried very, very hard, you know, from the age of 16 to the age of 33. Did her damnedest to keep it together but gave up pretty much when, I, when she was 26 and she had me. I was the youngest, you know, 10 kids under the, six kids under the age of 10. And she was like, and we're done. <laughs> uh, she crawled into a bottle and, uh, and when, they, when I was four, they got separated and my dad moved to the big city and she moved us into a two bedroom apartment where we were stacked like cordwood. And, um, and at that point, like everything, Everything I know about her, you know, she died when I was seven. She was 33, exhausted, toothless, pre-meth uh, toothless. And I truly believe that she is in heaven. And her definition of heaven is a place uh, where she doesn't have to have or raise children. I believe that is her idea of a really good time. And my experience with her was she was always drunk hung over, there was no supervision, and there was a lot of hitting. And she died in a motorcycle accident, drunk, uh, with the six of us living in this two bedroom apartment. And my grandmother never liked her. She always blamed her for all of our problems. My father, she was not supportive either of him, but that was her only son, and so that's how that went. And my grandmother learned how to keep on keeping on, you know, the sort of the keep going kind of thing. when. <clears throat> she was marched across Lebanon by the Turks in the Armenian Genocide in 1915. I won't go into it. Uh, <laughs> thank you, God. But, but whenever she talked about the march, she would, try to, she would never talk about the horrors. She would always talk about the day-to-day -day parts of it, the weird sort of daily... She said that the Turkish general, for example, that, um, that came and took over their village, was in charge of removing their village. She said he was one of the good ones and let them take their livestock with them. And um, 
She said, she, she mentioned that they had to leave so quickly that there was still bread in the oven. They didn't have time to get the bread or to turn off the oven. And so for 80 years, she was freaked out about ovens. And uh, could you imagine 80 years later, just be like, is the oven off? I'm still, I think we burned some food in Turkey in 1980, 18, 1915. But, um, but my grandmother's grandmother was supposed to ride this donkey that they owned and the village priest stole it. Oh yeah, when she first told me this story, by the way, it was not the village priest, I was eight. Uh, it was, she wanted me to respect uh, the priest until I was 15 and then I got to find out that it was the priest. Because uh, the village priest steals the donkey and as you can imagine, in a tiny Armenian village uh, in Turkey in 1915, uh, there's the priest and then there's God somewhere below the priest. The priest, priest slightly, slightly more powerful than God. Uh, my 17-year-old grandmother took a two-by-four and beat him off of the, the donkey uh, so that her grandmother could ride it. And uh, she was sexy. And, uh, and she worked it, you know? I mean, she kept plugging day after day. She had these stories of them, just months of them walking, walking, walking. And so she was not supportive of my mother. You know, she wanted to have six kids. That was her dream, you know? And, but she wanted to have six kids with someone who was home a lot. And my father, he, you know, my father was never home. He was a salesman, right? So he, what he would do is he would give his check and then it was a madhouse because there were six children. And so he'd go back out and go, ah, I gotta go, I gotta go make some sales. Well, no, he doesn't. It's 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> who are you selling to? And, uh, <laughs> So they got separated when I was four, and it wasn't anything I said, but uh, they separated, and um, my dad then gave the money to my grandmother from afar, because my mom would just drink it away. So, um, and my brothers, they just roamed, we all just roamed like animals until my mother's death, at which point my father picked a much better martyr, or a citizen, uh, to lead the charge. Nancy Cation. Nancy Cation, my, uh, my stepmother, was a dream come true for my grandmother because neither one of them wanted to raise us. Uh, but my grandmother could safely leave it to Nancy because my dad, in addition to being in sales, he knows some shady people. We're very proud. Uh, in the 60s, he did a lot of errands for them and hung out with them. He wasn't made, like he wasn't a, you know, he was like a bag man for, for a bookie in Milwaukee. This is not a Corleone. This is not a soprano. This is a, a bag man for a bookie in Milwaukee, whatever. It's, it wasn't even Chicago. So, but he had his own table at the restaurant, right? And, he, and so we would talk about how he had a lot of ladies around him. He was working it. You know, he wore a lot of dapper outfits. He was very handsome. I believe he had a knotted scarf at one point. We have a photo. And uh, he was very handsome. He's a very charming guy, and he's funny, and... and he met Nancy at this, she was a hairdresser, uh, one of five children, had always sort of, um, just sort of plugged along, nobody exciting in her life, not a lot of excitement going on with the fellas. And so she met my dad and she fell for him, like super hard fell for him. And she told me that, uh, that when they, for they lived together for, uh, for three years, they lived together almost immediately after meeting. And she said, you know, I knew he was married but I never knew that he had any kids. And I was like, wait, you knew he was married and you still, what, what's happening? And, uh, and she was like, I know. And she said, I, I, I had an idea he might be, he might have kids. And I was like, what is happening? How old were you? And she was like, I was 23. I liked him. There was nothing I was in, you know? And so my mother died and I could just, my father's the kind of guy who always thinks he's already had the big conversation. <laughs> I've already told you this, I'm sure is uh, something that's constantly going through his head of everything he's never wanted to tell anyone. <laughs> so essentially, I picture him saying, so my wife died, I get the kids back. And Nancy going, uh, the kids? And he's like, yeah, the kids, Terry, Philip, Scott, Russell, Darla, Jackie, the kids, <laughs> seven to 17, you know. And then she married him. <laughs> The best reason to never take her advice about gentlemen uh, was the fact that she married him. And, uh, but my grandmother was psyched. And 
She took us, mostly feral, uh, and slapped us into order. I've said it before, but she was a great loss to the Austrian army. There were charts, there were graphs, there was dinner time, curfew, bedtime. We were fed, clothed, disciplined. I was read to. I was seven, eight years old at the time. I was read to, I was sung to, I was hugged. I had birthday cakes and presents. But it was very clear that she wasn't doing it for us. I mean, I have no illusions about why she did it. When I was 15, she told me while making dinner, you know, I never wanted kids. And all I could think was, out loud, really? That's, that's, that's an inside your head voice. And uh, um, and I remain grateful to this day for that she did what she did. You know, our grandmother always insisted that she saved our lives. Possibly, very possibly. I mean, it certainly gave me a sense of order that I never knew that I wanted quite so much. And I loved her as much as she wanted any of us that wasn't him to love her. And she lived fake it and next indicated thing in the hopes that it would all work out. And it seemed to for much longer than anyone would have called it. I mean, she, called, she showed up every day and cooked us breakfast. Then she went to work and then she came home and cooked us dinner. My dad would pop in, try not to get too bogged down in the day to day, and then pop out. He didn't drink, he worked hard, but he's a gambler and he loves the ladies. So, you know, he would stay longer if we were clean, quiet, and interesting. So she made us clean, quiet, and interesting so that he would stay longer. And when he wasn't there, then she'd watch TV and read a book at the same time multitasking to stop the doubts, no doubt. But the first, you know, internet, watch TV, multitasking, surfing, that we all do to stop the voices. And, uh, and as a child, I tried to make myself as unobtrusive as possible. I'm sure I was as annoying as any other seven to 17 year old girl, but I tried to play by myself and read and write and finish my homework and my chores. There was always a low level theory in my head that I would, could be kicked out. Kicked out of the house if I were trouble. My oldest brother had been kicked out because uh, he was trouble. And so I was like, I'm going to have to be kicked out and join the circus, you know, at the age of eight. Uh, <laughs> get this, he was 17 and he was selling drugs, not attending school, having naked women over to his room, and then he punched my dad. Uh, none of those were happening with me. I was not about to be kicked out, uh, it turns out. I was a child. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it wasn't going to happen. And when they broke up, when they finally broke up, she raised us, she took his, my grandmother and her mother into their house and nursed them until they passed away. And then they got divorced. And it was like she was in some sort of separate world. It was like a nether world. It was weird. She started drinking a lot more. And as the years went by, she stopped caring what she did for a living and just got kind of sicker and sicker. She created a Kissinger-like revisionist history of our childhood that was exciting uh, to find out about. Turns out she loved us dearly, and she cared a lot about her grandchildren. Hmm, she has not met most of her grandchildren, but in theory. Um, my father has not met many of his, uh, his grandchildren or great-grandchildren, but he, there's never any theory. My dad had uh, lunch with my sister uh, a couple of months, uh, my brother had lunch with my sister a couple of months ago. My dad, what happened? Uh, my dad had lunch with my brother Phil. They're sitting at lunch. <laughs> my dad says, hey, I talked to Darla a couple of weeks ago. And my brother Phil goes, she took your call? And my dad goes, was she mad at me? She mad? At, why would she be mad at me? And uh, uh, Phil goes, well, you know, they had another kid and you haven't acknowledged it. And he goes, well, does she know I don't care about any of your kids? <laughs> and my brother, Philip, who has four children, uh, said all he could do was laugh. That's all he could do. That's all he could do is laugh, because he's a piece of work. And, uh, <laughs> but she, um, she would only see me. I was the only one who would keep in touch with her after, after they, they broke up. And she would only talk to me because I would call her. I was the only one who called her every month. And she'd want to know about him and what he was doing. What was he doing? How was she? She was still angry. She was still very sad. 
but always fascinated. And him, he, he knew that I saw her, so he'd be like, how's Nancy? But with this weird, he couldn't, hearing about her just makes my dad feel this vague sense of guilt that he doesn't know what to do with. So he never brought it up. When I was around when he was a kid, he'd have all this advice. He'd hold court and we'd listen and argue and laugh. And he believed in us, he really did. He just didn't want to be around us. And the first line of any advice that he gives you is excellent. It's full of interesting like information and love and belief. But the second line is always a mess. <laughs> he would say things like, you can do whatever you want to do in life, as long as you don't get caught. <laughs> and I'm like eight. And I'm like, is that the rule? Are you sure that's the rule? And Nancy's in the background waving him off like a catcher going, that is actually not the rule. That's actually not the, let's go watch MASH. And uh, you, he would say things like, you can be anyone. You can be anything you want in life. Remember, Jesus only started out with 12 followers. <laughs> what? <laughs> Did you want us to start religions? <laughs> if you want. And I believed in him. Like, and I believed that I could get away with things and I could be anything I wanted to be. But I also did things like I would steal change off of the bar. I skimmed off the top at my restaurant job and sales jobs. I stole merchandise from retail jobs and I would say whatever mean, funny thing that I could think of in any situation. And I was not happy, oh no. Uh, but I felt like I was doing the next indicated thing, right? I was still alive. I had a job in addition to doing stand-up. I was not a burden on society. And but I wasn't happy at all, at all. And so it was like 15 years ago, I started to go to chiropractors and massage therapists and purveyors of powders and tonics. Uh, <laughs> and the saner ones would always say, if you do esteemable acts, you will have esteem in regular life. You have to be a good person to feel good about yourself. Fake it till you make it. You know, pretend you're a good person. Fake it with your actions toward other people until it becomes second nature, a habit that becomes fact the longer you do it. And I think about that when people say to me, you're so nice, you're such a good person, and I feel like the biggest fraud in the world, because I'm just pretending sometimes, right? I mean, my greatest character defect, my second greatest character defect is that I'm mean to idiots. And my first greatest character defect is that I think it's funny. And I don't want to change. But I've been faking it for so long that I feel like, I mean, there's the revelation is that, you know, if I keep pretending to be a good person and do good things because I'm pretending to be a good, if I die, that's it, everyone wins. There's no, there's no loser in this situation. If I fake it forever and then I leave this legacy of trying that nobody knows about, that's okay, right? That's all. Thanks a lot. <laughs>